Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. My name is Sergey, and I was born in the USSR. My special thanks и огромное спасибо to all my supporters on Patreon.com. Thank you, comrades. It's greatly appreciated. And today, due to the popular demand, uh, we're going to talk about life of the handicapped people in the Soviet Union. To be honest, I'm not sure why people were so interested in such topic, but it is what it is. So uh, here we go, uh, life of the Soviet handicapped people. So let's learn a new Russian word. Invalid. Invalid. So that means handicapped person. And I believe that word probably came from French language because I recall seeing something like Invalid's uh, house or something like that in Paris. So I decided to start my story about handicapped people in Soviet Union by introducing you guys to Ivan Kurtov. Uh, he was a Soviet photographer, professional photographer. He worked for a um, news agency in Soviet Union and he made this famous picture in 1989. It's a very, very powerful picture, although it was staged. Uh, it was taken in Leningrad, as I mentioned, in 1989. And it shows a veteran of World War II, an invalid, as you see, Anatoly Galimbievsky, and uh, three sailor cadets and their officer paying respect uh, to this veteran. So when Ivan Kurtov took this photo, and once again it's 1989, so this is right at the end of the life of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev had power, we got Perestroika, we got Glasnost. So he took this photo uh, to show to his newspaper. He worked at that time also for Leningradskaya Pravda, the Leningrad Truth. But their um, editor refused uh, to publish that picture, this beautiful photo, because he said we cannot uh, show handicapped people on the newspaper pages. So keep that in mind. Editor refused to publish a picture with the handicapped person. But Ivan uh, Kurta was a persistent person and he knew he had something very, very uh, good. So he took it to a different newspaper called Smyrna. And at that time, that newspaper was the most liberal, I guess we can say it that way, in Leningrad at that time. And what happened next was history. Readers loved the photo. It became so popular that other newspapers started repenting it. It went all over Soviet Union. And then, as a result, um, Ivan Kurtov actually won a first place. So he won a gold medal at the World Press uh, Photo Competition. So that was admitted as the best picture of that year, of 1989. So once again, let's take a look at this photo very carefully and just think about it. Do you see anything kind of out of place, something unusual maybe for you? You're looking at the veteran of the war, decorated veteran. His name, once again, Anatoly Golombievsky, and he was a sailor, Navy sailor and engine mechanics uh, from the destroyer Sabrazitelny during the World War II, as, or as we call it in the Soviet Union, Great uh, Patriotic War, Velika Atechstna Vaina. When his ship got damaged, uh, he volunteered into the naval infantry, or and they call them in America Marines, and he was one of the uh, first sailors that attacked the beachhead by Novorossiysk in February of 1943. It was so-called Battle of Malaya Zimlya, can translate as a little land. Later, in the early 80s, it became very famous because Leonid Brezhnev, our leader, was part of that operation. During that horrible battle, um, he was actually the only survivor of, from the very first group of Marines, and he got shot into both legs, but uh, they couldn't evacuate him for seven days, so when they finally uh, got him off the Malay Zimla, they had to amputate uh, both of his legs because of the hangrene. I think I said the word right. For his bravery, uh, he got awarded with quite a few different medals, Orden Lenina, one of the highest awards in the Soviet Union. Orden Oktyabrska Revolucii, October Revolution Award. A total of three Orden Atechstnaya Vayny 
first and second grade. So it's the Patriotic War Award, first and second grade. I'm not sure what the difference, but he got three of those. Orden Krasnoy Zvezdy, Red Star Award, Medal Zabaronu Odessa for defending Odessa. That's the seaport in Ukraine. And also a medal for defending Kavkaz region, Zabaronu Kavkaza. And now let's go back to our picture. I wonder what was your thought, guys, when you saw it for the very first time? You know, I showed this picture uh, to one of my uh, co-workers, he's American, and he thought, his first thought was that was Photoshop. Because Americans usually don't see their handicapped people sitting that low. And he kind of like, well, usually it's like a Civil War veterans used to be riding those little cards. But you know, for the Soviet person, for like a guy like me who grew up in the Soviet Union, this is normal. This is what I saw. I mean, we didn't have a lot of people missing both legs, but if somebody that's severely handicapped, that will be the card. It almost looks like a little moving dolly uh, that our handicapped people used, and it's handmade. In Soviet Union, they did not manufacture wheelchairs for handicapped people. So you have to find somebody who can bring you some ball bearings from work. You know, you have to steal it. And then you just build that little wooden platform. And then you have those two little uh, push uh, devices for your hands so you don't scratch your hands on the pavement. So let's think about it. Let's put it into perspective, I would say. This is 1989, 44 years after... Soviet Union won the war against Nazi Germany. So in 1957, in October, the Soviets launched the very first satellite, Sputnik. So only 12 years after the end of the war, we managed to beat America into space race. Less than four years later, on April 12, 1961, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the very first Men in space, once again, Soviets beat America in space race. Around the same time, in 1959, the Soviet Union launched the very first in the world surface nuclear ship, nuclear icebreaker Lenin. Moving along, in 1966, the Soviets designed and built this science fiction project, ground effect plane, that got a nickname Caspian Monster. 1969, the Soviets successfully landed on the moon Luna Hod, the very first remote control robot in space. And this list of amazing achievements of the Soviet Union goes on and on and on. But guess what? By 1989, the Soviet industry still didn't figure out how to build basic wheelchairs for its handicapped people, for its heroes of the World War II. And then if you noticed, I mentioned earlier that photographer Ivan Kurtov, when he brought his picture to the first newspaper, his newspaper, Leningradska Pravda, the editor said, we don't publish photos of people with disabilities. So this is really interesting because that goes way back in history. And I'm not sure if anyone noticed uh, that we talked about Soviet people who traveled abroad. There was one interesting uh, recommendation from the Communist Party leaders. So during the selection process, when you look at the applications for people who would like to travel, uh, there was a preference not to send anyone who has some visible disabilities. So basically, Soviet leaders wanted present Soviet people abroad like they just stepped off the propaganda posters, not real people. But let's go back to the main character of our story, Anatoly Galimbievsky. His life story is actually quite amazing. Uh, while he was in the hospital after his legs uh, got amputated, uh, he managed to impress a nurse so much that she fell in love with him and married him, being amputee, and they spent the rest of their lives together had two kids and he got a job uh, in Leningrad and did quite well for his conditions. 
I think he was one of those rare people, you know, like one in a million that uh, loved life so much that he, despite his severe disabilities, still managed to uh, succeed and be happy, have family and so on. Anatoly was also a very handy guy and he managed to figure out how to convert his little Zaporozhets car uh, so he can drive it without uh, need to use legs that he didn't have for the pedals on the floor. But Anatoly was probably more than a, like exception from the rule and thousands of other handicapped people in the Soviet Union they didn't have uh, such luck or determination so they went on the path of drinking, gambling, begging, but that's the topic for my next video. Well, comrades, that's all I got for you for today. I hope you enjoyed this story and maybe learned something new. If you have any questions, please uh, post below this video. Don't forget to like it. It always helps to promote according to YouTube magic algorithms. And we'll talk to you soon. One of the ways you can support this channel is by buying my book, American Diaries 1995. It's available in Russian or English. You can purchase it on Amazon.com or send me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you. Today we're going to talk some more about life of the disabled people in the Soviet Union. And actually, today's video, I will uh, answer your questions that you guys posted in my previous video on that topic. The first question about uh, uh, disabled people treated in the Soviet Union by the government's people blind death, lost arms and legs, spinal injury and so forth. I kind of answered a little bit in my first video and then uh, was there any disabilities um, help for them? Braille markings, closed captioning for TV broadcasts. As far as I know, we didn't have really anything uh, to help disabled people. We didn't have anything like here in America. I know there's no little like if you want to cross the road, there'll be a gentle ramp, not the bump to get off the sidewalk. I believe in the 70s, they had a law that required uh, any place of business or school or college to be handicap accessible so people can roll in and out using a wheelchair. We never had anything like that. Our public transportation was basically inaccessible to anybody who is handicapped. I mean, people would uh, help somebody to toss him inside of the bus or the tram, but otherwise we had nothing. All right, next question. Sergey, I instantly thought about making a wheelchair using bicycle wheels and then realized that I hadn't seen any bicycles in your pictures. Were there many in the USSR? Actually, if you're interested in the topic of bicycles in the Soviet Union, I recorded one video so far. It's called I like to ride my bicycle in the USSR. Uh, you can check it out, go on my playlist, or I can post the link below this video. Yes, we had quite a bit of uh, bicycles in the Soviet Union. Not that many in the big cities. That was mostly like for kids. Since when you live in the uh, tall apartment buildings, it was a big challenge to drag your bike on your ninth floor. I mean, you had elevator, but good luck to, you know, put the full-size bike in there. So mostly kids. Uh, some people rode bikes for recreations. And that's actually how my very first bike was stolen. I just became too lazy to drag it through my apartment all the way to the balcony. So I stored it outside our apartment by the trash collector. And I did it for about a week. And then someone noticed it sitting there without lock and uh, my bike disappeared. Now in the villages, bicycle was pretty much the major uh, mean of transportation. Pretty much every household had uh, one or two bikes, usually one. I remember a couple of families had two. One was lady style uh, because you couldn't own horses. Uh, motorcycles were expensive. Cars were extremely expensive. So that was how the villagers would um, ride the bike to the store to purchase um, groceries. Uh, people moved hay on their bicycles and they went mushroom hunting. Uh, all kinds. Uh, that was quite impressive what you can do with the bike if you utilize this you know it was not even a cargo card but yeah there was a lot of bicycles out in the country but not many in the big cities and i just found out that actually we did manufacture uh, wheelchairs kind of bicycle type wheelchairs in the soviet union uh, but like one of the largest bike factories in minsk or kharkov i mean they were cranking out probably hundreds of thousands of bikes per year but they made one 
of this factory is made 700 three-wheeler uh, bikes for handicapped people. So 700 for the largest country in the world that went through the World War II. So this huge factory made only 700 bikes. So apparently there was a huge shortage of that type of bikes uh, for the handicapped people. I'm going to make a separate video about it. Next question. Comrade Sergey, uh, why do you think USSR did not build uh, wheelchairs? Or the question of cost, did the state provide financial support? Also, what about Soviet citizens who had mental disabilities? Was there any state apparatus to provide for them? The short answer would be government planned economy. That's as simple as that. When you have a socialist society, when one ministry plans everything for the economy based on a Communist Party request, this we get. You can have a Luna Hood robotic uh, vehicle on the moon, and then you won't have any wheelchairs because Communist Party didn't see it as a priority. Apparently, later on, maybe starting 60s, 70s, uh, they started manufacturing some wheelchairs, but in such a minuscule uh, amounts. So for amount of handicapped people, I mean, we went through the horrible war with Germany. Uh, there was maybe a half of a percent that actually needed. But since we had this culture of uh, pushing, you know, out of mind, out of sight, handicapped people, and there's no surprise that Soviet government didn't bother to invest into taking care of those people. And yes, of course, we did have uh, hospitals uh, for the citizens with mental disabilities. Uh, they called Psychiatrická Balnica. So it's like psychological uh, hospital. And it served dual purpose uh, besides people with severe mental disabilities, so-called crazy people. They're also being used uh, to lock uh, people who were against the uh, Soviet regime because you're definitely crazy if you're against Soviet regime. So if you didn't do anything criminal, they'll just uh, uh, figure out that I guess you're crazy, so you go to the crazy house. And that's where the people get locked up and uh, heavily seduced uh, with drugs and kept there for years. Okay, next question. Invalid, invalid, not in 100 years I could learn the Russian alphabet. But these words are pretty much the same. Um, it's actually Russian language if you learn Russian alphabet, which is, you know, just alphabet, you can read Russian really easy. We don't have uh, this weird situation like English has that letter A can be A or A or O. Uh, letter Bukva A is A pretty much. We don't have this kind of wild changes like letter I can be I or it can be other sound. So in that part, it could be E, you know, it's... It's quite easy, but otherwise, yes, Russian language is uh, quite difficult. All right, moving along. Uh, the disabled people in England were going no better at that time. You know, I, I'm getting such comments all the time, pretty much for all my videos is, well, in America, same thing happens, or England, same thing happens. A lot of it was about uh, Nisuni, people that were stealing stuff from the factories, comrades, you need to remember, we're comparing two totally different societies. Socialist society where everything was for people and capitalist society when everything was for the profit and for the corporations. So when you say, well, disabled people in England were not doing any better, of course, you had profit-driven society that didn't care about regular folk, didn't care about poor people, and then you have a Soviet Union when everything was for the people. Wink, wink. So this comment is going to make me smile. This is the whole point that a lot of people thought that Soviet Union, because of government was taking care of its people, uh, life for everyone was much better. We didn't have, uh, I want to say poor people. We didn't have rich people. We had <laughs> pretty much had everyone poor. What a shame that the Soviet Union did not do anything for its handicapped war veterans. The government was all about appearances to its own people and to the outside world. The irony that Soviets went to, into space yet at the same time was so far behind in its social programs for its lower class. Unfortunately, uh, those are side effects of the central plan economy. Abetsche's uh, Comrade Khrushchev's uh, son 
was handicapped and he would be complaining that he is having a hard time, you know, getting into the stores or and that his friends having a hard time. There is a quite a possibility that Soviet Union will be number one in the world taking care of its handicapped people. Or they maybe his son will be taken care of. They might purchase some cool wheelchair from America or England and it will it will stop. But that's the problem with the central plan economies. Uh, if there's no priorities, there'll be no product. In the same time, uh, Nikita Khrushchev thought that it's very important to show the world that we can beat America in space, and we did. And, you know, that pride will stay for years and hundreds of years, but, you know, any person going to die eventually and everyone will forget about him. It takes a great deal of insecurity to exclude people with disabilities from world consciousness due to perceived weakness. That's the great point. I think it's the... uh, can't find the word, but quite similarity we notice in Nazi Germany, right? So totalitarian regimes, they don't want to look weak, so they ignore or even kill their weak to appear strong. I mean, we can look back all the way like Spartans, right? They're so famous uh, warriors, but at the same time, they killed all their children that showed any disabilities. Hey, Comrade Cheeseburger. I remember you saying something about a car specially made for invalid people. So instead of wheelchair, that invalid should have gotten a car from the state. You're correct. I actually had the whole video dedicated to Invalidka, uh, car, really uh, interesting uh, device. You guys are uh, welcome to check it out. I'll post the link below this video. Actually, technically it wasn't a car. It was a quadricycle, so it's a four-wheeler uh, that looks like a car with a tiny 12-horsepower engine. And my guess they didn't make them enough because I saw them in the cities once in a great while. I mean, you could hear it first way before you see it, but I don't think it was any... Uh, off-road capacity, so in the villages they were totally useless. I didn't see a single Invalidka car out in the country. Hopefully in your next video you will touch on the plight of the differently abled children who were often abandoned in the hospital by their mothers and sent off to orphanages. Can never can say the word correctly. And some of those disabilities were so minor, but due to the superstition and ignorance, ignorance uh, just sent away from the perfect society. Honestly, I don't know anything about that, uh, but I recall my mother uh, mentioning when she was uh, uh, in the hospital uh, giving me a birth, uh, they had a young lady in their room. I mean, there was like six or ten uh, women in the same room, so, you know, uh, giving birth and having children. Uh, so as long as she uh, popped the baby, she stayed there for extra two, three days, and then she just left. Uh, so that was a pretty... I'm going to say robust system. It was quite easy to uh, refuse a child. You just tell them, I don't want to keep the child. And uh, there was, I guess, minimal paperwork because the her boyfriend was outside waiting and she just uh, left her child, cute little baby, and uh, that's it. But you also need to keep in mind that Soviet people were generally quite poor. Both had to work both could barely afford things and then of course you know like you need to go back to work three months after you had a baby so then what are you going to do with the baby then you have a really you don't want to bring your kid like i don't remember anyone in my um, uh, kindergarten that was anything like handicapped even slightly and i don't think you'll be treated nicely by the kids so you have this perspective of a long struggle uh, so a lot of people probably just made that hard choice. It's like we, we may have a try for another kid. We just can't afford uh, to have a handicapped kid. Next comment. I can understand Soviet Union saying we have no invalids like born that way. And weakness in genes like Nazis denied they had weakness. That's why Soviet Union also superior. So silly. But how could they deny injuries from war cause would cause this. This person should have been honored, high esteemed, gave up so much. Well, all I can add to Lin's comment is the attitude towards World War II veterans and especially 
handicapped veterans change quite a bit uh, with leaders. So, for example, during the Brezhnev era, uh, there was a quite a resurgence in memories uh, and taking care of in, uh, veterans because Brezhnev wanted to be praised for his participation in the war. So he was given the medals left and right. Um, they started giving cars away more generously. But before that, like Julian Stalin era, and I need to make separate videos on that topic, like he was quite disappointed the way the war turned out and he blamed a lot on his people, on his soldiers, because 1941, 1942, um, right now modern historians are trying to analyze and understand what happened. It's pretty much like we had superiority in everything, in numbers of soldiers, in tanks, airplanes, like Soviet army was the largest army in Europe in 1941. We had more tanks than Germany, England, and America, and everyone else combined. More airplanes than everyone else combined. And at the same time, we're, we're just destroyed. So it looks like almost Soviet soldiers didn't want to fight. So Stalin was not happy with performance. Even he won the war, the losses were so staggering. The, uh, it just was pathetic performance on the Soviet part. So I think it's one of the reasons why he didn't care all but about his veterans and especially about handicapped veterans. Invalid is used in English too and is from Latin validus meaning strong and in prefix means not, I believe. That's correct. Um, when I looked it up, uh, the Russian version of uh, origins of the word invalid, it says that it came uh, to Russian language from French language and in turn it came to French from Latin and it says invalidus means not strong. Well, this comment is quite long, so you guys can pause the video if you want to read the whole thing. But basically, uh, the person said that he lives right now with Russian fam family in Russia. Uh, and asked my Russian wife, where are the disabled people? Why isn't current infrastructure built to accommodate people with uh, physical disabilities? Which is a great question. This is continuation of situation in the Soviet Union, actually. Okay, uh, I just a quick comment. Uh, who runs modern Russia? There's no new generation of leaders in the Russian government. Comrade Putin, it's a former communist, former KGB officer, or he never can be former KGB officer. So this whole mentality, whole attitude towards disabled people remain the same. And unfortunately, although oil prices were fantastic for a long time and Russia made billions of dollars, they never bothered to improve infrastructure. Actually, the whole Russian economy in large, they still live off remnants of the Soviet economy and that economy and infrastructure, I want to say, and it's slowly disintegrating because they don't provide really good upkeep. Uh, so, yeah, there's no surprise uh, that modern Russia has no uh, things done for the handicapped people. Next question. I wonder if Soviet war veterans always wore their medals and military decoration as shown in many photos. Of course not. Uh, most of these pictures were taken during official um, holidays. Mostly, I would say, May 9. It's the Soviet uh, Victory Day, which is celebrated every year. Pretty much when Brezhnev uh, became the leader of Soviet Union, that's when they started doing this uh, May 9 parades. Before that, we had no parades for the Victory Day, believe it or not. So that'll be the main occasion to put medals on is May 9 celebration or October Revolution celebration or if the veteran is trying to get uh, something from the government he goes to some of uh, office then he put all his medals uh, to show that he deserved uh, whatever he's asking for. Did the Soviet Union have a veterans pension or veteran hospital system? How were disabled people from their Soviet wars like Afghanistan treated? Yes, we had a veterans pensions. I need to dig into the topic because uh, I honestly don't know much about it. My grandfather, Sergei, uh, he was a soldier during World War II, prisoner of war, but I don't recall uh, for him to have anything additional payments. Um, so I need to find out more about it. But yes, we did have a military hospitals. They weren't called uh, veterans hospitals. So if you get wounded, you go first to the military hospital and then later maybe treated normal hospital uh, so yes we had pensions but i don't think there were anything that great 
and that you can uh, have a good lifestyle out of them. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. As always, please don't forget to uh, put like for my video story, share with your friends in social media, and we'll talk to you soon. Hello, comrades, and this is John Wayne Cheeseburger speaking. Welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. Меня зовут Сергей. Я был рожден в Советском Союзе. So today we are returning to the topic of World War II handicap veterans. And we're going to talk about uh, what kind of benefits Soviet government provided uh, for such people. But before we get going, I would like to show you a couple um, interesting documents uh, from the Soviet era. This green book uh, from 1976, it titled Secret, Secretna. I want to call it the Bible of the Soviet mass media. And the title of this book, this Bible, List of Data Information Forbidden for Publishing in Public Open Sources, Radio and TV. So this cute Soviet Verboten reference book was in use from 1948 all the way to 1991. So every newspaper, every radio outlet or TV station had this book as a reference. Can we talk about this or can we talk about that? So one day when I'm going to run out of topics for Shanka show, I probably just going to make a series, when we call it days of our Soviet lives. There'll be like maybe 100 or 200 episodes just looking and translating this beautiful green book. But for right now, we're just going to take a look at one page. So on the page 20, chapter number 3, information about Great Patriotic War. Number 98. It is forbidden to publish general information about effects of war on workers' health, such as pandemics, birth rates drop, food rations and their effects on population health, living conditions and such. And below that, number 100. It is forbidden to publish general information about the amount of war war II invalids, generally in the USSR, as well as in republics, regions, cities, and villages. So here's your small clue that Soviet government actually considered secret information to publish anything about the amount of uh, war handicapped people and just and it's specified not just all over Soviet Union even in a little town you're not allowed to say how many uh, you have World War II veterans who are handicapped. Okay so the other document we're looking at it's uh, from the declassified KGB documents and it's actually a report from the mail censors so the people who open uh, mail and check it out for stuff so this is a report, and part of this report is titled uh, Complaints from the War Invalids. So that came from the letter uh, written uh, from Ukraine, Vinitsa region, to some uh, military outfit in January of 1946, so shortly after the World War II was over. And the letter said, My life is very bad right now. Well, everyone knows about the conditions these days. I became a cripple. Why did the bullet fail to kill me? Why do I have to live as a cripple? I asked the guys to finish me off. They didn't want to, and now no one cares about my condition. But what can you do? I will have to suffer for the rest of my life. And what's interesting, on the bottom left there's a little note that says, so some kind of document K was uh, sent to a local... Um, prosecutor in this uh, Tulchin, so there's a Vinitskaya Oblast, it's a Vinitsa region, and there's a smaller, like, a county called Tulchinsky County, I'll say that way. So KGB or NKVD at that time, you know, they check the letters, they find complaints, and then they send notifications to the local officials or local NKVD uh, places, uh, to follow up what's going on and maybe they help the guy um, you never know and here's another interesting uh, unclassified document it used to be top secret совершенно секретно appears it was dated in uh, from 1948 uh, so this is from the high ranking NKVD official uh, sent out to the all uh, military censorship offices uh, 
from army, fleet, and such, and it's uh, talking about confiscating any photos of World War II handicapped veterans. They said they noticed um, cases where the pictures were sent in letters showing uh, pictures of single or group of uh, handicapped invalides. Of, of I keep on saying World War II, but it's a great patriotic war. So there's instructions saying that they must be confiscated and uh, verify that letters don't contain any negative information about it. So here you go. So any information, anything was suppressed about life of a handicapped uh, veterans in the Soviet Union. Okay, so now we are ready to talk about benefits that Soviet government provided for its uh, World War II handicapped veterans. As a kid that grew up in the Soviet Union in 70s and 80s, I definitely remember that every store had a sign said that Invalidy Velika Tishna Vaini Absluzhuitsa Vni Ochiridi. So, Invalids and Veterans of World War II, or Great Patriotic War, uh, gets a serviced skip in the line. So, there's like always <laughs> considered should be a, would be a line. So, there is the line. If you're a veteran or a handicapped person from World War II, you can skip the line and purchase goods without waiting. Uh, for those who follow my channel, uh, you may recall uh, my story about summer of 1986 uh, when I left Kiev. So that's after Chernobyl power plant exploded in April of 1986. Uh, so after school was over, uh, me and my friend uh, left for Leningrad to stay with his grandmother. She wasn't a handicapped or veteran, but she lived in Leningrad during the blockade of 1941 till 1944, I believe. Uh, so later on, uh, people, like even civil population that lived in the city of Leningrad during the blockade, they got the same benefits as veterans. Uh, so I kind of enjoyed a little bit this uh, skipping the line uh, benefit. One day she took us around Leningrad to show the most ancient places and of course, you know, it's a tourist mecca. So there were always lines everywhere, but she just pulls her little ID, shows to the person and they will let us go skipping the line. Uh, like for example, we went to see Petergov, that uh, famous uh, summer residence of, uh, so, uh, <laughs> of Russian czars. And it was a huge line to get on the ship because you, uh, you take a boat to that place and we just skip that big line. That was pretty awesome. And as I mentioned earlier, after Leonid Brezhnev became the leader of Soviet Union, uh, benefits uh, for the veterans of World War II and especially handicapped veterans improved drastically. And maybe that was the reason why my grandfather, Sergei, who spent four years uh, being prisoner of war in Germany and then almost died in Stalin's labor camp, he really loved uh, Leonid Brezhnev and even put uh, his picture among the photos of his relatives, like on the most prominent spot. And I remember uh, two uh, neighbors in our village uh, received a free car, ZAZ Zaporozhets, because they were um, invalids of the World War II, although the rumor was that one of them uh, he was a teenager and they were playing with the grenades that they found in the woods. So he got a shrapnel up his butt cheek, but he managed to get a paperwork that he was invalid because he got hurt <laughs> during the war. But right after the war, 1946-47, uh, things were quite bleak for the veterans and for the handicapped veterans. Like they were getting a stipend. Um, like so the first category of veterans, so they're missing all limbs. Uh, we're getting between 80 to 150 rubles per month. The invalids of the second category, so you're missing one limb, leg, or arm, uh, we're getting twice less of so between 40 to 80 rubles. And for comparison, one liter of milk was 10 rubles. So pretty much if your second category missing a leg, you get enough money to buy one gallon of milk per month because it's about 40 rubles. One kilogram of pork was 120 rubles. So your first category invalid, you pretty much uh, get enough money to buy one kilogram of pork a month. They also were getting like a so-called payok. So it's like a food assistance, um, which consisted what I found like nine kilogram of flour, 
about uh, 400 grams of uh, sukhari, so that's like a dried bread croutons, uh, some sugar, uh, four kilogram of salt per month, and one liter of kerosene, which is not food, but that was part of that assistance. And another interesting uh, type of assistance was assistance with the firewood, because a lot of people lived out in the country or even small towns, they were using wood burning stoves uh, to heat their houses in the winter. So central government uh, told local governments to provide assistance to the invalids with firewood, but they're like, uh, of course, they didn't have manpower. So they say, yeah, sure, you can go to the forest and cut some trees and chop some wood. But of course, when you're a handicapped person, you can't do it. So that was quite useless. So a lot of uh, invalids had a hard time to stay warm in the winter because they had the right to get some free firewood, but they just couldn't. Like my grandparents and the photos I'm showing you, that's pretty much being retirees. Uh, that's how they spend all their summer harvesting firewood in a collective farm forest. You know, they will assign them a specific area and mark some dr trees that they can harvest. And that's all summer will be cutting, uh, sowing that wood and then chopping it, cutting and chopping it all summer long. So they have some firewood for winter. And of course, uh, World War II veterans as well as World War II handicapped veterans has a special, uh, special waiting list. So not the general waiting list, but just for them. So they were shorter. So for example, if you wait for apartment, uh, 10, 20 years, maybe if you're a handicapped person later during a cruise shift time and Brezhnev time, you might wait only five years. Same for cars. I mean, if you're a handicapped person, but you still can drive like regular car. So instead of waiting um, nine years to buy a Lada, uh, you can get a car maybe in four years or two years. Well, comrades, uh, that's all uh, what I have for you today. I hope you learned something new. As always, don't forget to like this video, share with your friends, and we'll talk to you soon. Меня зовут Сергей. Я родился в Советском Союзе. My special thanks и огромное спасибо to all my supporters on Patreon.com. Thank you, comrades. It's greatly appreciated. Today we are returning to the topic of handicapped people in the Soviet Union, and specifically handicapped veterans of the Great Patriotic War. Today's video may upset uh, quite a few people, especially the ones that uh, like to live in their tanks, but we need to talk about it, uh, so let's get going. But before we start, we need to do a little like a warm-up, because this is a pretty heavy topic, so uh, let's talk about a couple uh, events and a couple details that we need to know before we start uh, talking about the fate of the handicapped people who came back from the World War II. So if I ask you a question, what is the largest country in the world? You better tell me that's Russia. And that's correct. Russia is the biggest country in the world. It occupies 6.6 .6 million square miles. So even after losing 14 republics in 1991 and Alaska earlier on, Russia still is the largest country in the world, almost twice bigger than the uh, next country, Canada, with 3.85 million square miles. So, of course, before 1991, Soviet Union was the biggest country in the world, and it was about 8.65 million square miles. So, huge territory, right? But remember what Shrek said in the movie Shrek when they saw that castle? Sure, it's big, but look at the location. And that's exactly the problem with the Soviet Union and Russia right now. Sure, it's big, but look at the location. Similar to Canada, Russia, and before that, Soviet Union, most of its territory is so much up north that it's really not habitable for humans. I mean, there is a small town next to the hole in the ground where you dig some minerals. Otherwise, it's not really a good place to live. And I'm sorry I have to drag you through this geography lesson, but I think it's very important to have this perspective, big picture, because it will help you to understand what I'm going to talk to you about next. 
So please, bear with me. So similar to Canada, big but look at the location Soviet Union starts where the United States stops. So pretty much like Southwest Michigan where I live is is same parallel as a Crimean Peninsula in the Soviet Union. So when I tell my friends from back home that in the summer Americans go up north camping to spend their vacation, they can't believe it because in Soviet Union in the summer you go south for your vacation. So that's why the Crimean Peninsula became the hot spot uh, for vacation for everyone from the Soviet Union. People just went down south to Crimea to spend vacation and enjoy sun and sea. And Crimea was the place where the party leaders had their dachas and where the most of the health spas for the Soviet workers were built in the Crimean Peninsula. So here's the question. When in 1950 the Soviet government opened Dom Invalidov Vainé Truda, you can translate it as the house for invalids or handicapped uh, people uh, of war and laborers. Where do you think um, they picked the location for this place? If you answered Crimea, I would totally agree with you because that's the most logical location to put a health spa for the war and labor invalids and handicapped people. But it's not the case. Comrade Stalin chose different location, about 1,000 miles north from Crimea, on Valam, which is archipelago in the northern portion of Lake Ladaga. It's the 61th parallel. Valam archipelago uh, had uh, quite a few abandoned uh, monasteries, Russian Orthodox monasteries, uh, that became abandoned after the revolution. So that's the buildings that were utilized to open the house for handicapped warriors uh, from World War II. If you ask me, that's the horrible location, but it's out of mind, out of sight, right? On an island in the middle of nowhere, up north, I mean, try to get supplies there in the winter if it's a stormy weather, but that was the whole idea to get uh, those handicapped soldiers out of the cities, out of sight, out of mind. And back in my days in the Soviet Union, I never heard of that place. It was almost like secret location, although that uh, Dom Invalidov was open for 34 years. They closed it finally in 1984 when the last veterans passed away. Only when uh, Valam Notebook Valamskaya Tetrad uh, by Evgeny Kuznetsov was published. Uh, Soviet people found out about this uh, scary, sad place. At its peak in 1959, Valam uh, Dom Invalidov had about 1,500 handicapped uh, soldiers. And now it's only just unmarked graves. No one actually tracked the people. There is no record who was there, why they died, when they died. Uh, so it's pretty sad. But it's not the worst part of the story yet. So here we need to talk about deportations. And you need to know that NKVD, the secret police of the Soviet Union under Beria, was quite efficient in deportations. For example, after Germany attacked Soviet Union in June of 1941, in September, October 1941, NKVD deported around 440,000 Germans that lived in the Soviet Union, mostly in the Volga region. So in 24 hours, they moved to Siberia, Kazakhstan, and parts of Asia. As I said, 440,000 Germans. In total, there were some Germans in other areas, around 950,000, almost a million people of German descent were deported for their places of live out to Siberia and Kazakhstan. Similar efficiency was displayed uh, during deportation of Tatar population out of Crimea 
in May 1820, so two days of 1944, uh, they deported around 200,000 uh, people to Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, and later on about 30% of those people uh, perished. Also in February and March 1944, around 500,000 Chechen people were also deported. And it's all because they were cooperating with Nazi Germans, apparently. Uh, so Stalin punished the whole nation. So over uh, around 500,000 people were also deported to Siberia. Okay, so now we are back to the topic of handicapped people of the Invalide of World War II. You probably know that the Soviet Union had terrific, horrible casualties during the World War II. I personally grew up knowing the number that Soviet Union lost 20 million people during the Great Patriotic War, but the latest data says that its actual number more like 41.9 million people. 26.9 of them Red Army soldiers and officers, and the rest is civil population. So the latest data that I saw is 41.9 million lives lost at war. And of course, a lot of people got wounded, lost their limbs. So total around 2.5 million uh, people became handicapped uh, because of war. Around 450,000 of them were missing legs or arms. And they had a special like group in like group, uh, first group is like you are so uh, damaged that you have to be taken care of. You can take care of yourself. Then second uh, grade is like you can, you cannot work, but you can, you know, take care of yourself a little bit. And third grade, you can actually be able to work to do some uh, labor besides uh, you still handicap, of course. So it wouldn't be a surprise uh, to know that after, right after World War II, in 1945, 1946, uh, big cities like Moscow, Kiev, Leningrad, and others were like flooded um, with handicapped people. A lot of them were missing legs or one arm or two arms. Some of them had uh, nowhere to go, and some of them didn't want to go home because they realized that they'll be just extra mouth. You know, if you are missing legs and arms or just legs, there's nothing you can do in the village. You can't really work at the collective farm, but there'll be just extra uh, trouble, extra mouth to feed for its family. So they prefer to stay in the big cities where they can beg for money uh, or steal or something like that. And I can't believe this, but people actually came up with quite mean uh, words uh, for such handicapped people, the ones that are missing legs and uh, arms. Uh, one word uh, they used was abrubak, which is the same word we use, like if you take a branch and you cut little branches off, so you have just this kind of awkward stick with the little thing sticking out here and there, it's abrubak, and that's how they called uh, handicapped people that missed all four limbs. Another, I don't know if I can say, a derogatory term uh, they used was samavar, which is has really short handles to pick it up and really short legs. So that's another word they used to call uh, such a poor handicapped people, samavare. Yet another term was chimadan. So there's like traveling case. Since you have no legs, no arms, uh, you can, you know, people could pick him up by the belt and just carry him around like a chimadan, like a traveling case. Are you still with me, comrades? I'm sorry, this is long and very boring story, but we have to talk about it. So I found some uh, witness account actually from Kiev, from my hometown, um, and the guy, he was a kid back then, um, he was saying that around 1945, 1946, so right after war uh, was over, in Kiev, around Besarabka uh, market, that's where the peasants or collective farm workers would bring their goods to sell. Um, there were around 400 uh, such handicapped veterans, Abrubakov, and they would just uh, beg for money, play cards, uh, trying to, you know, win some money. And uh, so they were kind of like annoying because 
they were you know you walk by and they try to grab you by hand and say hey i lost my legs defending you why don't you give me some money or give me some food uh, so there was around 400 just in that one area and of course you know if there'll be gypsies begging for money uh, our police militia would maybe arrest them or make the move but of course uh, police felt bad they didn't want to harass veterans you know they had medals on them and uh, so they were just living there and trying to survive, you know, as I said, begging for money or uh, playing cards for money with the peasants and stuff like that. And then in May of 1946, uh, they suddenly disappeared, like almost overnight. One day there were a bunch of veterans uh, begging for money, and next day there was none. And there were just rumors that there was order from famous Marshal Zhukov uh, to clean big cities from the beggars and they snatched all the handicapped veterans and sent them somewhere no one knows where. And once again we're talking about events of the spring of 1946 and the place on Valam Island opened up in 1950, four years later. So what happened to these uh, veterans that disappeared in 1946, no one knows. I mean, there were just really scary rumors. And then there was a, a, some witness uh, who was actually um, in labor camp in Siberia on the Yenisei River. And he claims that he saw um, barges uh, going down the Yenisei River towards uh, Ahotskaya Sea. And they were packed full with uh, handicapped people. And they were only going one way, never came back. So the rumor is, and I hope it's not truth, that they uh, load up these handicapped poor guys on the barges, took them out to the sea, and they sunk the barges uh, to get rid of these handicapped people. And he said he saw those barges uh, in 1946 all the way to 1951. Every summer there will be barges floating down towards the Hotska Sea and never coming back. I hope one day we'll find out the truth, but I'm really skeptical about it because still there's a tons of uh, archives that are still classified, uh, still secret about events of World War II. Uh, Russian government still doesn't want to open archives to modern historians, and a lot of documents related to the Stalin area are still classified. Uh, so we'll be interesting to find out what actually happened but this is what i managed to discover uh, here and there and i hope it's not true well it's all i have for you guys today uh, <laughs> can't wait to see comments uh, if anyone knows any information please share in your comments and don't forget to like this video share with your friends and we'll talk to you soon До свидания. goodbye